how to achieve success even if you've never succeeded at anything before. I've been a fan of success, fan of successful people for as long as I can remember. And I became a super fan of success when I actually became a student of it. Um, I can still remember the first self-help book that I ever read and really how it catapulted me into reading every single book that I could get my hands on. Um, books would get supplemented with podcasts and TED Talks and lectures. And to this day, I still consume at a bare minimum at least one book a week. And I, and I usually do that on Audible. But I read in some book that the average American only reads one book each year. And the overwhelming majority of the books that are actually read are romance novels. Go figure. Anyways, I felt like I, I'd found an area where I can proactively outwork other people. Right? They're reading about the different shades of gray while I'm busily uh, reading See You at the Top by Zig Ziglar or The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Um, and it's, it's said that success leaves clues. If you follow around people who are in shape and watch their daily activities, you'll start to pick up on trends or clues that kind of explain why they're in shape. And oftentimes the clues that success leaves are uh, so widely known and, and understood that they really don't feel all that powerful. And I realized that on this quest for success journey that I started to look over clues and instead was more interested in the most alluring word on the internet, at least it was, and that is hacks. Success hacks. Uh, these are kind of like cheat codes. Uh, I remember growing up, I used to put in cheat codes when I would play Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Um, moon gravity and perfect balance were favorites of mine. Now, hacks are things that give average to below average people, or in this case, uh, video gamers of uh, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, give average to below average gamers the ability to not only break high scores, but to completely destroy them. Um, now, are there actual hacks available for achieving success? And if so, are they possessed only by a select few uh, or can they be learned? Right? Are they commonly known or do you have to hit right, left, L1, L2, square, triangle, left, left, R2, and then burn the piece of paper that you wrote the cheat code on? Right? So the, the, the question that I became consumed with, and I first heard it from uh, Brian Tracy, and it's, the question of why are some people successful and others aren't. And by others, I was for a long time, I meant myself, right? You may be sitting here wondering when and if the dam to your success will ever break. Like at what age does potential translate into production? And what age does potential become wasted potential? Now, I've had to confront these questions that were swirling around in my mind. And I also had to check myself to make sure that I wasn't getting bitter as I saw others around me who were seemingly accomplishing much, much more than I was. Maybe blame it on the age of social media. And this, this leads me to my first um, kind of observation. This is something I've had to do, and that is to check your filters. So a couple, month or so ago, I recently got an Instagram account. I had one probably over a decade ago, but I got it back and it's changed a lot. And I've, my uh, son Jackson and I, we've had a ton of fun playing with the different filters. And there are filters that it'll show you how your face would look if it were perfectly symmetrical. Um, there's others that'll show you what, uh, what you look like with perfect skin or a perfect smile. And then there's others which make you fat or make you have a huge nose or look like a Viking or something. And my point is that I've come to realize through a ton of self-reflection, as Dan Sullivan puts it, thinking about my thinking, um, as well as hundreds of conversations on this topic with people who've uh, been on our show uh, and others just around the country, that we all use filters when we see others. And we also use filters when we see ourselves. So in order to achieve success for the first time, at least in your mind, it's important to check these filters. Now, I'd be willing to bet that you save all of the make you look better filters in your life for when you're looking at someone else, especially other people who, at least in your mind, are at a higher level in success. 
and you've saved all the make you look like shit filters for when you look in your own mirror and at your own life. Now, Theodore Roosevelt once said, comparison is the thief of joy. And he was absolutely right. And here's why. If you're honest with yourself, the only comparisons you actually pay attention to and likely the comparisons that you make overwhelmingly more often are with those whom you consider above you or you consider to be doing better than you. So let's say you've got a 1,500 square foot house and it's sitting on a quarter acre of land and it's nice, it's well kept, you like your neighbors. And then there's that freaking dude that you went to high school with and he's got a 2,500 square foot house and he's on a half acre of land and I bet he probably likes his neighbors even more. And the more that you look at his life and the amount of success he's achieved, the more you simultaneously size it up to yours. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself coveting his life, hating yours, and really you'll start to resent him, all likely without him even knowing it. So how to check your filters and start really seeing a path for achieving success of your own, it, it's not to block out and completely ignore those who are further along or above you or whatever, but rather to draw inspiration from it. Sometimes the simple thought of, well, if he did it, and there's no reason I can't, instead of feeling envious that his house is bigger and that his life is definitely better than yours, well, look at it as proof that it's possible for you. And also recognize that there's a good chance that he's doing the same thing you are. Only he's not comparing his 2,500 square foot house to yours and feeling good about himself. Chances are he's comparing himself to the other guy that you went to high school with, who he's got a 3,500 square foot house and he's not wondering why the hell am I stuck in this dump while he's enjoying that mansion, right? The same thoughts going through your head likely are going to his. Now, the first step to achieving success, even if you've never succeeded at anything before, is to settle it in your soul right now that it's possible. That simple thing, it's possible, is ridiculously powerful. And checking your filters will help too. So make sure the picture of someone else that you have in your mind isn't artificially photoshopped to make his muscles look bigger and more defined, right? To give him perfect skin and get the, the perfect life filter that maybe you're looking at others in. And also make sure that you're not, uh, you're not photoshopping your own mental image to make you actually fatter or paler or less successful or worse than you actually are. I remember playing at East Carolina, um, Coach Holtz would, would often say, and I quote him all the time, it's uh, the son of Lou Holtz. They say it's never as good as it seems and it's never as bad as it seems. Right? It's never as good as it seems and it's never as bad as it seems. So that's the first thing. Check your filters. All right. The second thing that I've found that has really helped kind of push me over the, uh, over the edge is to immerse yourself in success. So for many, the idea of achieving more being successful in some regard is very foreign. It's, it's an abstract concept like love, or like courage. And you may have very few frames of reference to draw from. So I've noticed in talking with a lot of people over the years that they've been limited to maybe what they saw growing up. In other words, unconsciously, they're kind of replaying the home movies that they made as kids with their parents with their siblings and because of this they find it very difficult to kind of break past that barrier I touched on this earlier about having to settle it in your soul that it's possible now I want to talk to you about what it is so after college man I got immersed in books and programs on success you know how to be successful how to win friends and influence people the millionaire next door and I picked up a ton of helpful thinking habits and just habits in general based on the author's relentless pursuit to the question why are some people successful and others aren't and look, this was extremely helpful. I learned about having an abundance mindset, uh, the importance of, of work ethic and persistence, the rags to riches stories, and all of that. 
It opened me up to a world that I never knew existed, because let's face it, through high school, especially back before social media, I mean, our, wor- our world was largely the homes we lived in, the schools we attended, and for me, the sports that I played. And what reading books helped me develop was the language that so many of the very successful heroes used if you spoke with them. So I got a ton out of it. And while I don't question the contents on those pages, I just hadn't seen it with my own two eyes in my own life, right? There's a, there's a huge difference between theory and practice. And it's good to learn about how to work out, right? The methodology behind it, the proper angle to have your incline, your, the incline bench set at to optimally target your upper chest. You get the point. But knowledge in and of itself just gets you to the door, right? It's applied knowledge where the magic is. And by immersing yourself in success, I mean more than just the strategies that previous successful people used and the things that they did that no one else did, yada, yada. I think of Peyton Manning. They always say he's the first to arrive and the last to leave, right? It's, it's, it's good to know that. I started to take a fascination in the successful people around me. Right? I started asking successful people out to lunch and started picking their brain. and I asked them how they did it. Right. When did they know they were going to do well and that they were doing well? And you know what kind of work did they do and all of that? And by doing this, I learned a couple things that have always stuck with me. So the first lesson I learned was that each person's journey was unique to them. Sure, there were underlying trends, the how-tos that I had read exhaustively about, but my eyes were open to the seemingly endless possible routes to take to success. And of all the people that I talk to and that I continue to talk to today, and that I continually pick their brain today, I've yet to find two carbon copies of each other. Right? I've yet to find two people who said, you know what, Matt, I got this one book, How to Be Successful, right? and I follow the steps to a and got success. Right, what, I, what I learned was that there's something inside them that made success almost seemed guaranteed. They had a certainty about them, a calm confidence as I like to call it. Maybe it was the way they talked or how they carried themselves or whatever, but there was a noticeable difference between the people that I aspired to be like and those that I did not. I picked up on the things that they talked about and I found... Um, glaring differences with the things I found myself talking about. I also learned that they didn't constantly sit around thinking about success. And I reasoned that, hey, they probably did back in the day when, when they didn't have anything. And, and you know there may be some truth to that. But if I had to sum it up, I was chasing success. I've been chasing success. And they were embodying it. They were living it. Everything they touched seemed to turn to gold. And they knew it. Not in a cocky type of, look at me, I'm a superhero type of way, but more so an acknowledgement of this innate ability they have. Now, by immersing myself in success, by getting the presence of those who had actually experienced it, I was able to start learning how they thought. Whereas up to this point, I had learned primarily what successful people thought and what they did to lead to their success. It was almost as if these people were sick with the success bug. And by being around them, I started to catch it. And eventually started to show symptoms. That was a game changer. So, just quick recap. Check your filters. Immerse yourself in success. And the third third kind of uh, observation I've found is the importance of finding your unfair advantage. So let me ask you a question. What do you think is the most single or the single most important factor in Shaquille O'Neal having the amount of success on the basketball court as he did? All right, what do you think it was? Now, to me, it's pretty obvious, right? His number one factor, his unfair advantage was his incredible size and his athleticism. Now, sure, he worked very hard. He probably stayed after practice to get more reps. He probably even studied other greats in their prime, and he modeled his game after theirs and and likely found a higher level of success. But while doing those things will make anyone a better basketball player, it was Shaq's God-given genetics 
that carried him to the highest level. But Matt, Shaq's wildly successful off the court, both while he played and since retiring. And I'm not questioning that at all. I'm simply saying that without his unfair advantage, he wouldn't have had the opportunities he has now to live the life that he does. Now, while each successful person's journey, i.e. maybe the vehicle uh, they use to achieve it, each of their journeys that I've spoke to and read about are unique, one thing I've noticed over and over again is that they were keenly aware of their own personal seven foot. Right? I actually talk in those terms now. What's your seven foot? Right? What's your seven foot advantage? No one taught Shaq how to be seven feet tall. So it's my belief that in one way or another, everyone has something that they do, some natural ability, some God-given talent that once harnessed could propel them to the top. I talked earlier about our tendency to look for hacks in accomplishing success and um, how often it's fruitless. And that's because hacks are often sought after to give maybe a six-footer, a six-foot guy, the benefits and the fruits of being seven-foot. It's the belief of uh, something for nothing. And to me, it's the mark of being lazy. And I'll talk on that later, but it treats success like it's a winning lottery ticket, right? But think back over your life, okay? Maybe back to the time that you were in school, and I'd be willing to bet that there were some classes, some subjects that you did well in without trying, and others that you had to bust your ass in just to get by. Okay, school is the enemy of finding your unfair advantage. The kids you look up to in school, I remember the kids I looked up to, they're the ones that got straight A's. Right? They were the true superhumans. The goal wasn't to get an A+, plus, it was to get straight A's. And straight A+, pluses if you could, but it taught you to disregard the A that you got without trying because only the A's that you got from studying ridiculously hard and uh, the A's you got from hiring a tutor and staying after class and missing parties with your friends, those are the ones that are the most valuable. Now, Shaquille O'Neal dominated on the basketball court because he played to his strengths. He absolutely dominated everyone else physically, especially around the basket. Won four NBA championships, and to this day, I don't think he could shoot better than 15% outside of the paint. But who gives a shit? Right? No one is great at everything. In fact, upon closer inspection, I learned that the most successful people that I had the chance to meet and get to know were clear on two things, right? What they're good at and what they're not. And they'll readily admit the list of things that fall under the not really good at category is much, much longer. The report card of successful people after leaving school often has an A plus and a lot of other did not completes, right? So find your seven foot and then go find a point guard to team up with. And it's almost as if magically success just happens. The final point I want to hit on, arguably one of the most um, impactful things that I've I've picked up on as I've uh, continued to raise my level of consciousness, if you will, but it's titled simply, Feeling is the Secret. Feeling is the Secret. Now, much of the books that are written on success have to do with the hows, the how-tos, the observable things successful people do that unsuccessful people don't, right? And from the outside looking in, it seems so simple. And for, for a lot, for some, you know, really, it is that simple, right? Just copy paste what they do. And to an extent, I agree with that. If anything, I have a tendency of maybe getting too philosophical about trying to uncover the motivations and the feelings and the whatever and the whatever beneath the surface reasons that people do what they do. And, um, can sometimes overcomplicate it. 
you know, actually I had to take a break from consuming how to be successful material because while it made me an expert on how others achieved great things, it hadn't helped propel me to do the same. Right? As Jim Rohn, the late great Jim Rohn once said, no one can do the push-ups for you. But once again, I'm confronted with this age-old question. God, why are others successful and I'm not? If it's as simple as do these things and don't do those things, why is it so daggone hard to discipline myself, to discipline yourself and to do the right things and to stop doing the wrong things? And the answer is you don't feel like doing the things that you aren't doing. It's really that simple. I remember hearing this seemingly innocuous phrase a few months ago and it, and it stopped me in my tracks, right? You don't do stuff because you don't feel like doing it. And for a long time, you may have felt like something was wrong with you for not achieving things you wanted to achieve or thought that you would achieve at this point. Maybe you thought you'd be a lot further along than you currently are. You feel like your chance to succeed is, is slipping away. You're not as young as you once were. My point is that you likely aren't underachieving simply because you don't know the different things you should be doing. An obese person doesn't suddenly read a study that says Cheetos and um, it doesn't, I'm sorry, doesn't read a study on Cheetos and learns eating 20 bags a day is what's making them fat. And if they just replace those bags of Cheetos with bowls of lentils or green beans or some other healthy thing, then they'd be okay. Right? Here's the reality. The Cheetos taste a hell of a lot better than green beans. It's not an intellectual gap. It's simply a don't feel like it gap. And as stated earlier, that the title of this, this last point is Feeling is the Secret. And this is actually taken from the title of a wonderful book as written by the late Neville Goddard. So how do you make yourself feel like doing the things that you likely know should be doing? Right, maybe you're overweight and you know you should be going to the gym to work out. You may have talked with uh, formerly uh, obese people who are now in shape and they told you that it changed for them when they started going to the gym and working out. You may have even read a book titled How to Go to the Gym and Not Be Fat Anymore, yet you still don't do it. And it eats you up inside as you eat everything on the outside, <laughs> right? You may, you may call yourself worthless, a failure. And then you may actually simultaneously start to put these in shape people who go to the gym on a, you, you, you put them on a pedestal. Somehow they wake up every single morning and they fight the exact same go to the gym demon that you do. And instead of losing, they slay that dragon. They slay that demon. They overcome that every morning. But guys, here's the reality. And, and there aren't many areas that I can speak with authority on. And not many areas that I have the results to back it up, like going to the gym. And I've, I've got a confession. It is absolutely not a chore to go to the gym. Right? I go to the gym because I feel like it. It's not even a decision. That decision was made a long time ago. And even if I take time away from the gym, <laughs> maybe I oversleep for, and get out of the routine a bit, or during COVID when the gym shut down, you know, my physique may not look its best. Even in all that, I have absolutely zero doubt or zero fear in my mind that I can or that I can't get right back to where I was. Because in my mind, I'm in shape. I'm jacked. I'm muscular. I'm whatever you whatever you want to call it. I, that's who I resonate with. So going to the gym is easy, right? That's it. Not going to the gym is tough. You see how that works? So I couldn't imagine going to the gym as much as I do for as long as I've gone if I detested it. If I had to give myself a pep talk every single morning, man, that would be purgatory. And the reality is I just wouldn't go. <laughs> it's really that simple. So how do you do it? Hell, how do I do it? Right? First of all, begin with the end in mind. Why do you want to be successful? Why do you want to make more money? How much is more? And I'm not searching for some politically correct, altruistic, canned answer to that either. You want the finer things in life? Good. 
you should. The finer things are, well, finer. Reminds me of the line from The Wolf of Wall Street where Jordan Belfort said, I've been a rich man and I've been a poor man and I choose rich every time. Or maybe you're watching this and you're a Christian. Maybe you've convinced yourself or you've been convinced by others that your worldly ambitions are of the devil. Right? Only poor people go to heaven because rich guys, man, they got to go through some eye of a needle and, you know, that doesn't seem very likely. And so rich being rich is evil. And I mean, imagine the conundrum that so many ambitious believers are in, right? On one hand, they desire and, and oftentimes achieve success. And on the other hand, they think that their success and their desires may lead them straight to hell, right? How do you reconcile those two? Or perhaps you think there's a finite pie of success out there. And the only way that you could get a bigger slice of it is for someone else to get a smaller slice. Right? Now this makes you feel guilty for any success you do achieve. And also makes you likely resent the bigger slice that, the bigger slice that others have. It kind of causes a seesaw between guilt and bitterness, neither of which lead to anywhere worth going. Okay, forget all that. Do you have a desire to succeed? Do you want to succeed? And if you answered yes, then you have everything you could ever need. Because without desire, or a red-hot burning desire, as Napoleon Hill put it in his classic Think and Grow Rich, without that, you're not going to persist long enough to see any fruit. So do me a favor and settle another thing in your soul right now. Just take my word for it. Your desire for success, for the nicer things, for the finer things, for whatever it is that you desire, means you already have it. God or the universe or your subconscious or superconscious mind or whatever you want to call it speaks to you and directs you through your desires. As a believer, that means he knows and hears what you want because he's the one who put them there. So free yourself of the guilt that you likely associate with success and with, which is likely largely holding you back from attaining any of it on your own. Let me ask you this. What would it feel like if you were in possession of the thing that you desire most? Man, how would that actually feel? Because remember, feeling is the secret. Not how would your kids feel or how would your spouse feel or, or any of that, but how would you feel? Neville Goddard sums it up by simply saying, what would it feel like if you were free? Too often we, as humans, as conscious beings, we give way too much power to unconscious things like money or a sports car or whatever. Perhaps you desire to have $1 million in cash in your checking account. That's a pretty damn amazing desire. Now the scarcity side of you will immediately start to point out how ridiculous that is, right? The humble side of you will tell you about how greedy that is and you don't need to have that much money. The broke past side of you will point out how you've never had more than a, maybe a few hundred or thousand dollars in your account and, and desiring a million dollars is silly. Like, yeah, whenever pigs can fly, ha ha. These things likely are happening all at once. But again, who cares? You desire that, then you already have it. It's yours. What would that do for you? So the background on my phone is a quote from Neville Goddard, which uh, I love it. It's the lock screen on my phone. It says, you are already that which you want to be. And your refusal to believe it is the only reason you do not see it. Catch that feeling, the feeling of your wish fulfilled. And don't worry about the hows, just focus on that feeling. And by resting and surrendering to that feeling of your wish fulfilled, that feeling of freedom, 
you will start to rearrange your inner being and your mind. So I want you to imagine there's two pieces of metal on the table in front of you. They're the same size, color, and texture. To the naked eye, they're exactly the same. The only difference, and it's a big one, is that one is magnetized and the other isn't. There isn't a special breed of magnetized metals and others that aren't. Sim similarly, you can take two almost identical people, right? similar intelligence maybe they have roughly the same advantages or disadvantages and one is successful and one isn't now it can be argued Shaq's size is the reason for his success and that'd be correct and you know maybe you're not seven foot so god I gotta be seven foot to, to be successful but here's the thing his size was the biggest reason for his success but you've got to finish that sentence his success in the NBA that size would have made him a horrible jockey. See how that works? So how do you magnetize yourself for success? In other words, how do you create a reality that tra attracts in the things that you desire when you seemingly haven't been attracting anything to this point? First thing to do is realize that your entire world around you is a, re a result of what you're magnetized to now. And that's because, and this will be the last thing I say on this, in life, we don't get, you don't get, I don't get what we want. We get what we are. I'll say it again. In life, you don't get what you want. You get what you are.